Were you the first person to come up with the theory that the pyramid was a power plant? Guilty. Uh, let me back up a little bit. There was, I mean, there was a general period of time in the 70s where um, there was a, a lot of interest in something what, that they called pyramid power. In that the uh, the pyramids have, by, just by the shape of a pyramid, it had this uh, kind of energetic value. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, talk about that. There was a book written by Patrick Flanagan uh, back in the 70s, it was called The Pyramid Power. Uh, there were other books written that referred to the Great Pyramid with talking about pyramid power. Uh, but it was a kind of a mystical kind of power rather than a practical. Mystical how so? Um, something that was not quantified in... Uh, physical terms or okay. three-dimensional terms not measured not measured it's more like something that we didn't quite understand mm -hmm. couldn't quantify and was that based on like people standing in the pyramids and it's based on a lot of uh yeah a lot of that kind of mm -hmm. information or that those experiences it was more an experiential kind of uh experience well, an experiential experience. Uh, mm. Scratch that. One. Right. Uh, no, it, it was more. It was more an observation. Uh, okay. And it, subjective. Subjective uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, some of it was, you know, they tried to measure it, uh, but they were measuring effects rather than identifying the what okay. kind of energy it was. Okay. Uh, the the sharp and razor blade experiment was very popular back then where the pyramid was said to if you put a razor blade inside a, a the pyramid a pyramid shape then the blade would stay sharp or longer what uh, yeah so it had a, <clears throat> a lot of different uh, a lot of different values is that uh, true does the, does the razor blade stay sharper longer if you keep it inside the pyramid um, I tried that, and you know, I, I did it. I said, "Well, I'm going to try it." So I, I used a razor blade for a little longer than I, you know, that I, I thought. But then I had a, um, you know, my, the thought in my mind was that you're doing those kind of experiments, those are already done. Uh, what was needed was a, a complete kind of reverse engineering mm. of the structure um, uh, <clears throat> to determine and, and find answers for every single part of it. Right. Uh, what was originally designed into it, um, what was introduced afterwards that was not a part of the design, what... Uh, the operation of the uh, the pyramid, what effects that may have had mm. in certain areas, and so there is quite a lot of um, quite a lot of information uh, <clears throat> that uh, I had to go through to find answers for a lot of mystery, a lot of mystery. But the thing that struck me the most is the uh, the incongruity of the the shafts, the small shafts. There's a there's a story behind those that is uh, quite exciting, really. But it, it's it's really they're really really important uh, <clears throat> to the function of the machine. So yeah, all of that struck me immediately with the the, the precision, uh, just the the angles, um, the different shapes. It was all very machine-like mm. to me. And I think, you know, when it comes to saying that the pyramid was a machine uh, to uh, produce energy, um, then, yeah, I was probably the first to uh, actually put that out. What type of machine do you believe that this pyramid is, and how does it work? In my 
first book I called it was called The Geezer Power Plant, as you know. And uh, yes, okay. So the Geezer Power Plant described the Great Pyramid. I described it as a a coupled oscillator, uh, in that it was connected to the Earth. Um, its proportions were an integer to the Earth, and mm-hmm. it was tuned harmonically to the, vi- the the vibrations of the Earth. That was what I proposed, mm-hmm. and as such, uh, it reacted to the the Earth's pulse or the Earth's hum uh, vibrations. And and through that, they were able to stimulate uh, electron flow in the central granite chamber, uh, <clears throat> and um, and produce microwave energy. So basically, I described it as a a, a maser, but it was a, a maser, like a solid state uh, le- uh, maser, a solid but, state electron harvester. <laughs> Well, that's what I ultimately I called it. Yeah, it was a electron harvester, hmm. and so that that was uh, in my first book. I didn't call it electron harvester. Oh, that was until the for, new book. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I realized that you know a lot of people um, will look at the the word power plant, and the the vision that comes to their mind is like smokestacks, you know, mm-hmm. uh, right? Long trains of coal snaking through the the countryside to these power plants uh and so you know kind of uh and then and then of course you know power plant a nuclear power plant coal power plants, right. and stuff like that right so that it's uh, generally associated with boiling water uh, creating steam mm-hmm. pushing turbines and uh and drawing the electrons off the uh, generators mm-hmm but the uh, <clears throat> this was kind of like a a different concept in terms of uh, creating creating energy or drawing energy from the earth uh, directly um, without without burning fossil fuels or uh, smashing atoms. So underneath, in the cover of the Giza power plant, you have the pyramid sitting in the desert, and then underneath that, you have like the it looks like lava underneath and then like the, the the crust of the earth so i guess you're describing that seismic activity that's happening under inside of the earth creating vibrations that are resonating with all the rocks in the pyramid yeah that is a that cover was a um, created by my publisher bear and company uh their artist and uh, basically it does represent what you just said Okay. You know, I mean, as far as uh, strict accuracy to engineering uh, drawings, that you, you don't see that there, but it, it loosely gives you an idea. Okay. Right. It represents the pyramid, energy coming out of the pyramid, its connection to the earth, and energy going on inside the earth that is tapping into. So you theorize that the pyramids were harvesting energy and generating energy to power whatever civilization created them. Yeah. And how do they get power from the pyramids? How do they get it? How do they use it? Oh, how do they use it? Yeah. Um, That is a good question. It's a question I get asked a lot. The, um, The problem that we have is... When when you look at the pyramids, so you go to Egypt and you you walk around the pyramids and the temples. You look you look at the skeleton of a civilization. Obviously, there's so much that's that's missing mm-hmm. uh, that has disappeared over time. Right. We don't know where. And so when you ask the question, well, what were they powering? You know, we don't find any microwave ovens out in the desert. So, uh, <clears throat> you know. And you probably won't, you know. The uh, the only thing that really survived from that period of time uh, was um, the rocks. The rocks, yeah, right. So you, you and you know some other materials, but the rocks uh, basically survived. Mm. And it's a matter of you know. Then again, 
you know, it's like, okay, so we what we're left with is the rock. So mm -hmm. what do we do? We take measurements. We uh, look at the design. We uh, we analyze the effects uh, of certain spaces like the king's chamber, the effects of that chamber with the acoustic effects of it, the uh, acoustic effects of the grand gallery. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot, a lot that we can we can study mm -hmm. um, to pr try and come up with some some answers as to how it how it functioned, what it did. 